Uh, today, to begin, off, to begin the service, we're going to read the first nine verses of Psalm 116. And I've got it on the screen here. If, um, if you just want to read it off the screen, uh, it's, it's in the English Standard Version, which is the Church Bible. Uh, so if you want to read out of the Bible, it's Psalm 116. But if you just want to read it from the screen, uh, that's, uh, that's, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be just reading the first nine verses. And you see, it is a psalm of testimony. Uh, the psalmist starts off by saying, I love the Lord. And uh, the passage of Scripture we're going to be looking at later, uh, the Apostle Paul quotes from this psalm. Uh, it's actually verse 10, which we're not going to read at the beginning here, where he says, I believed and therefore I spoke. Uh, he's giving testimony about his faith in God. So uh, let's read these verses aloud together, trying to stay together. So try to follow along with me as I read them. And uh, we'll read the first nine verses of Psalm 116. Here we go. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. This is God's word. You may have noticed a, a, a particular word you weren't familiar with there in verse 3. The pangs of Sheol. Sheol is a word that Bible translators uh, aren't quite sure what to do with. Um, sometimes it's translated as hell or the grave. And it's a word in the Old Testament that speaks of basically the grave or the place of the dead. So they often just translate it. No, they don't translate it. They just put it into English letters. Sheol. Uh, the New Testament sometimes uses the word Hades uh, for this word, which again is a reference to the grave or the place of the dead. But the psalmist testified of God's deliverance for him through a time of uh, trouble and difficulty. And he testified publicly, I love the Lord. And I trust that you were able to say that with faith and personal meaning as we read it out loud, that you all said to one another as you read that psalm, I love the Lord. Is that, is that true of you this morning? Uh, thankfully, we can gather this morning as Christians, and we can say, I love the Lord. And we don't need to fear criticism or, or mocking or anything else. Uh, we all share that same belief and feeling that we all love the Lord this morning. I trust that's true of you. All right, Ashley, if you wouldn't mind just turning the projector off for me. Um, that way we don't need to leave it on the entire service. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let's pray together and ask God's blessing on our meeting. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that your name would be glorified. We want your name to be lifted up because we love you and we know you are worthy of it. And we must acknowledge that, that we love you because you first loved us. How we praise you this morning for reaching down in your love and drawing us to yourself. Thank you for sending your son to show us your love by laying down his own life for us. And so we pray this morning that you would give us energy and strength to focus on you and your word. Please, 
work by your Holy Spirit to give us faith and arouse us to love and heartfelt worship. Lord, we do pray that you would be lifted up in all that we do this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, listen to hymn 245. 245. We'll listen to this sung through. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean.
Well, let's turn together to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. In the Church Bible, this is page 1162. And we're continuing in the passage we were looking at last week. Uh, The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he is defending his own ministry. There had been some tension and uh, difficulty uh, in his relationship with this church because they had gotten off track, and he he had had to um, write a very strong letter uh, correcting them and calling them to repentance. And on top of that, there were people there at that church that were trying to uh, get rid of Paul. They, didn't, they, were, they were trying to displace Paul. And so they were criticizing him and saying that even though his letters were strong, he himself was a weak person. Uh, and, and there were probably things about Paul that were unimpressive. He, he, he wasn't necessarily an impressive person to meet him. And, um, and on top of that, Paul, wherever he went, encountered difficulty and opposition. And so his critics could say, well, look at him. You know, he, trouble follows him wherever he goes. Certainly, he's not a true minister of God if, if this is what is going on in his ministry. And so Paul's writing to the Corinthians, explaining that actually uh, his weaknesses are ways in which God's strength is on display in his life. So we're going to finish this chapter. Uh, We're going to read this morning verses 7 through 18. And then in the next few weeks, uh, the plan is to focus on uh, themes that are more related to the birth of Christ and uh, this season of the year. So um, we'll complete our, our look at this chapter this morning. So follow along while I read aloud. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, and then down to the end of the chapter. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. There he's quoting from the 116th Psalm that we read earlier. I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is God's word. Please turn uh, in your Bibles again to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. And as we begin 
I want you to just take note there in chapter 4, verse 1. I told you earlier, Paul is talking about his ministry, the work that God had called him to do as an apostle. And in verse 1, he says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And he goes on to explain about that, why he does not lose heart. And then we see again in uh, verse 16, near the end of this chapter, he says again, So we do not lose heart. And then in chapter 5, verse 6, he says, So we are always of good courage. Uh, And so you can link those phrases together. Uh, to remind you that this this part of 2 Corinthians is all about not losing heart. It's all about keeping your courage. And it is true that uh, Paul here is speaking as an apostle. He was a preacher and a specially commissioned preacher uh, who who fulfilled a role that no one else could fulfill. Uh, There's no one else since Paul doing what Paul did. He was a foundational worker. And so there are things about Paul's life and ministry that are completely unique. Uh, In a sense, you won't ever be in his shoes. But in another sense, um, what is true of Paul and what, what Paul says about what gives him courage and what helps him not to lose heart applies to us as well. What might have caused Paul to lose heart? Well, I want you to just turn quickly to chapter 11 of this book. So several chapters later, chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul is uh, discussing how there are other people who who boast of their ministries and would even claim to be uh, more fit for Christian work than Paul is. And Paul begins to somewhat facetiously compare himself to them. He's not actually serious here. He's, in a sense, he's saying, this is ridiculous that I even have to do this. But let's talk about what it looks like to be a Christian minister and an apostle. And that's why he says, for example, in verse 21, to my shame, I must say we were too weak for that. He's comparing himself to what these other people had done. But then he goes on, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. Okay, he's saying it's ridiculous that we're even doing this, but because it's come to this. Uh, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. He means there, I feel crazy even saying this. But then he goes on, listen to this, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. In other words, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. All right, Paul opens his heart there and opens up the book of his life, so to speak, And says, if you want to talk about what it looks like to be an apostle, let me tell you. Let me tell you the things about my life that have shown God's strength. And he goes on to recount, as we just read, this horror show show of experiences. 
You'd think, um, you know, in modern times, if a Christian leader experienced just one or two of those things, uh, you'd likely to, 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 to see a book or two published about it and probably a speaking tour of the person going on to explain all these things that they've experienced uh, for the sake of the gospel. And Paul is just saying, this is just normal life for me. Beatings, shipwreck, danger everywhere. And as you read all these things, you can see uh, Paul was unusual. Although possibly there are even Christian leaders today, people we've never heard of in places where Christians are persecuted who've experienced some of those things. Now, we're not all given the same things to do as Christians. It's not likely God's going to call you to live a life like Paul. But you are called to live the same kind of life. What I mean by that is that in God's purposes for you, you will experience weakness. You will face times when you are afflicted and suffering. And, and you, will have, you will face the same opportunity to experience God's strength in the midst of grief, affliction, and hardship. You are called to live the same kind of life, even if you're not going to do all the same things that Paul did or that, a, or that some other preacher might, might do. And here Paul is discussing how to keep your courage in the face of trials and difficulties. Remember verse 1, verse 16, and chapter 5, verse 6, he says, we do not lose heart. And certainly as a Christian, we all face times when we, we might be tempted to lose heart, to become discouraged, to, to be overwhelmed with trouble, and, and just even contemplate just giving up entirely. And Paul says, I'm not losing heart. I'm, not, I'm always of good courage, in fact. How do we face trials and difficulties and keep our courage or not lose heart? I want to look at this from three different perspectives in these verses. And the first thing we must be reminded of here, if we are to, to not lose heart, if we are to keep courage in the face of trials and difficulties, the first thing that is essential is this. We must have faith in God. We must believe him, believe his words. And that's where Paul begins there in verse 13. He says, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, and then he quotes from Psalm 116 verse 10, I believed and so I spoke. Now, just, just a brief word of explanation here about what you would find. If you, if you go back to the, in your English Bible, Psalm 116, verse 10, you're going to see it's, it's, it doesn't read the same way as Paul's quoting it here in um, 2 Corinthians 4. And the reason for that is in your English Bible, Psalm 116 is translated from the Hebrew and Paul here is actually quoting from the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, or some people pronounce it Septuagint. And often the Septuagint is translated in such a way as to offer a bit of interpretation or explanation. They, some parts of the Greek Old Testament are, are translated not quite literally, but just to give you the idea of what they believe was meant by those words. And um, not to get technical here, but the Hebrew is actually, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar or anything. I don't, I don't read my Hebrew Bible every morning or anything like that. Um, but the Hebrew there is, is, a, is complicated and difficult to translate. So um, when, when the Old Testament was put into the Greek language hundreds of years ago, often they took a little bit of liberty in and just telling you, well, this is what it means when they put it into Greek. And that's often what Jesus quotes from, and that's often what the, the disciples quote, and the apostles quote from. So that's why you might find a difference between what Paul says here, quoting from Psalm 116, and what you might find when you turn to Psalm 116. But the idea here that Paul's drawing from is, is the idea that the psalmist 
believes God. He's speaking out of the abundance of faith when he recounts how God delivered him. And in that psalm, which we read together, part of it anyway, the psalmist is publicly praising the Lord for rescuing him when he was in dire need. All right, you might meet a joyful Christian or you might think to yourself, well, you know what? If my life wasn't so hard, I would be a more joyful Christian. And actually, what you find in the Bible is that it's the, the complete opposite. <laughs> the, the Christians who are the most joyful, the most satisfied with God's provision and help, the most content with their circumstances are not the ones who've not experienced difficulty. They are the ones whom God has brought through severe difficulty, like what you read in Psalm 116. Don't ever think, oh, I would be a happier Christian if God would just remove some of these trials from my life. Those trials are the very thing God is, wants to use in your life to show you his goodness, to, to let you experience his love and his faithfulness. And it's when you come through difficulty and you throw yourself wholly on the Lord's care and his help and strength that you come through it and you say, I love the Lord. It's when you don't experience any trouble and, and life is just calm and trouble free that, that your experience of God's care is, is minimal. All right, so the psalmist is publicly praising God for bringing him through, uh, for rescuing him in, when he was in dire need. You know, and we read some of these things this morning. He sums up what he experienced this way. He said, the snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. But then later on, he says, you have delivered my soul from death, my, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. David says, or the psalmist says, when I was brought low, he saved me. And that is what has led him to this joyful testimony he has in that psalm. So the psalmist believes that God cares for him and he's going to speak about it. That's the essence of what Paul's getting at here when he says, according to the same spirit of faith that has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe, he says, and so we also speak. And this seems to have a pretty broad application. He's, he's talking, I think, first of all, about his preaching. You know, if Paul would have just decided, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth shut about the gospel. All of his troubles would have been over. All right? If you, want, if you want to just avoid trouble in this life, well, stop living as a Christian. On the surface anyway, you'll avoid a lot of hassle that way. You won't be looked on as strange. You won't be persecuted. You won't be laughed at. You, you won't have people think that, that you're just kind of an oddball who doesn't really get what life is all about. But Paul says, we believe and so we speak. And for what, Paul, for what that meant for Paul was he was going to continue faithfully preaching the gospel, come what may. Uh, regardless of the fact that he was going to encounter trouble as a result of that. But, but this really is the starting point in dealing with any difficulty. You must say as a Christian, I know that I can trust God in this. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know necessarily why this is happening to me, but I know I can trust God in this. I mean, that is all, that's the whole, in a sense, that's the message of the Bible. Believe God. Trust in Him. And there's story after story of people that put their confidence in God. And God did not let them down. You could be, there's a story about three men thrown into a furnace because they wouldn't bow down to idols in the book of Daniel. They were literally thrown into a furnace and God brought them through it. Now, that's not to say that every Christian ever thrown into a furnace is going to survive. 
But in their case, it was God's purpose to bring them through it safely. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out of it. But they, they, they didn't know that was going to happen. They didn't know God was going to do that. They were willing to be thrown into the furnace and incinerated. They were going to be faithful to God. You must, you must say as a Christian, I know I can trust God in this. You know, picture, maybe you've seen this or maybe you've experienced something like this. Picture a, a dad in a swimming pool. And he's, and he's standing there in the shallow end and he's got his four-year-old on the edge of the pool and, and he's saying, just, you know, just jump in. You know, he's trying to teach them to overcome their fear of swimming or of the water. And he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm right here. You know, nothing will happen to you. Just, just jump in and I'll catch you. You, know, you might be afraid of the water here. You're, you might be nervous about this, but you know, I'm your dad. I'm right here. You know, nothing will happen. Just, just jump in. And, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of coaxing or even pleading or even you know, bringing back around, coming back to the same situation more than once. And eventually, you know, the child overcomes their fear and realizes, OK, that, you know, it's safe. I'm all right. I'll put my myself in the hands of my dad. And, you know, God throughout the Bible is saying this to his people. You know, I'm with you. I'm in control of everything. Just trust me. Now, Paul goes on then to talk about a couple of different things, specifically that he has faith are true. We see that in verse 14 and verse 15. All right, we're still on this first point. If you were to keep courage in the face of trials and difficulties, you must have faith in God. Trust in him, no matter what the circumstances. But he goes on then in verse 14 to speak of future resurrection and finding yourself in the presence of Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 14. End of verse 13. We also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. All right. Paul here is talking about faith in the future resurrection. And this is all the hope of the resurrection is, I mean, you really can't have Christianity without this. There are people today who would, would say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, no, that's not possible. We know that's just sort of kind of the early Christians embellishment of it. And the real thing, the real importance about Christianity is just having that love that Jesus had for other people, you know, being kind to people and doing nice things for your neighbor. That's Christianity. Well, you don't need a resurrection. Yes, you do. You're not a Christian if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.14, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Not only are you going to be raised, but you're going to be presented before Jesus. So think about that. Whatever you face this week, you could, you could spend the rest of your life persecuted as a Christian. One day God's going to raise you from the dead and you are going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. You are going to stand there before him. You are going to look at him and know that he is your redeemer. And Paul had his eye on that end goal. God made you so that you would live for his glory and then one day be with him forever. Forever. That's a long time. Paul also had faith that God would be glorified through his life. Okay, he says, verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. But then he goes on to speak of the purpose of what's happening in his life in verse 15. For it is all for your sake. 
he says. He's writing to the Corinthians, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul's perspective of his own suffering was that it was resulting in the grace of God spreading to more and more people. And let me just say, you know, even though you're not an apostle and none of you are preachers, it is still God's purpose to work through his people to spread his grace to more and more people. For you, okay, you don't have a congregation to preach to, but your congregation are those people in your life that God has put you with so that you could love them as you love yourself. And if they ask you about the hope that, is, that you have, you can tell them something about the gospel. God works through his people to spread his grace to more and more people. And the result of that is that it increases thanksgiving to the glory of God. And one thing that we have to keep in our minds when we are suffering and afflicted as Christians is that God is using this for his own glory. That's, that's why he's doing what he's doing in your life, for his glory. And there are times you may feel like, well, I don't see how this is bringing him any glory. Even if you yourself are trying to glorify God, you might think, well, no one else knows what I'm going through. Or, you know, I'm not really telling many people, I'm not able to tell many people about all this. Well, one thing, you should make that a matter of prayer. Lord, how can I, how can I better glorify you through this? How can I be a better witness because of this? But secondly, you just need to trust that God is working for his own glory in your life. And, and you need to ask God for help to respond to the affliction in your life in a way that is glorifying to him. So we keep our courage as we exercise faith in God. All right, friends, trust the Lord. Find his promises in his word and trust in those things. Don't, don't act like the jury is still out on whether God is faithful or trustworthy. He has declared what he is. He has made promises. He's given you a Bible full of stories and examples of how he has been faithful in the past. Put your trust in him. And that will really enable you in this second area, here's, here's the second way that we, that we keep our courage, that we don't lose heart. It is through, this is second now, through our personal experience of God's grace. Verse 16. Paul here returns to one, his big objective in this part of the letter. He says, so, in light of what he's just said, we do not lose heart. And he goes on to recount a little bit of what this looks like in the life of the Christian. He says, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So this is another way that we don't lose heart, that we keep our courage. It's, it's as our, even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This is personal experience of God's grace, his sustaining help in your life. There is the reality of physical frailty. All right, verse seven of this chapter, he said, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Remember, you are, you might think of yourself as being a fairly talented or, or gifted individual. You're just a clay pot. If you're a Christian, the greatest thing about you is not your intellect or your education or your can-do attitude. It's not some skill that you've acquired through your life. It is the fact that you have the gospel and the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and God is working to make you more like Jesus Christ. Your outer self is going to waste away. And those of you that have lived a long, long time 
You've experienced this physically. You remember days past when you had more energy, when you didn't get so tired, when you had more physical strength. Don't fret too much about that. That's, that's, the way, that's what happens to everybody. And even if you're younger, you feel like you're on top of the world physically maybe. Uh, you are battered about by circumstances. You experience weakness in other ways. The outer self is wasting away, but the inner self is being renewed day by day. All right, just a few verses to support this uh, as a reality for the Christian. Colossians 3.10, you have put on the new self. Or if you're a Christian, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So you've become a Christian, you've put on the new self, and your in, inner self, your character is being renewed to be more and more like Jesus Christ as you come to know him, primarily through his word. Jesus said in John 7, 38, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that passage goes on to explain that Jesus there is speaking of the, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Isaiah 40, verse 30 and 31, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That, those are promises for those who wait for the Lord, putting their trust in Him. So we maintain courage. We keep from losing heart through faith in God, through our experience of, of God's grace, this inward renewal, which God often works as He puts you in difficult spots. He makes you more like Jesus as you follow Jesus. And following Jesus means that you will suffer. You will be afflicted at times. So through faith in God, through inward renewal, and then finally, through a proper view of your life. In verses 17 and 18, or verse 18, Paul talks about what we look at. All right, we need to have a proper view of our life. Verse 17 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, it's strange that Paul would speak of affliction as light and momentary when he is already, later in this letter, he's going to say, everywhere I go, I encounter danger. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten with rods. I've been lashed with whips. I've gone hungry. I've been exposed to cold. I've been chased by enemies. And you might think, well, light and momentary? That's not how I would describe it. That sounds pretty heavy, pretty constant. But in comparison to what he calls the eternal weight of glory that we experience one day when we're in the presence of Jesus Christ, any affliction in this life is light and momentary. It won't feel like that sometimes. This is where what Paul says in verse 18 comes into play. Where are you looking? Where are you looking? All right, he says in verse 18, as we look not to the things, okay, affliction will seem light and momentary as this is going on in your heart, verse 18. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. Okay, that, that means temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. All right, that's how affliction can, can be light and momentary in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that we're going to experience one day. One day you're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ and even just the, any experience of 
fallenness and sinfulness will be completely gone. You will no longer be tempted to sin. All of your sense of affliction and weakness will have been eradicated. You will be in a place of eternal joy where, where love is the, is the all-consuming uh, sentiment and outlook of everybody there. And you won't be jealous of anyone. No one will be jealous of you. You will be glorified with Jesus Christ. You will be rewarded for whatever you did for Christ's kingdom on, on this earth. Things that only happen because God helped you and God worked it out in your life. You will be in the presence of God. And it is an eternal weight of glory. So if you were to take all of your affliction from this life and put it on one side of the scale, and the glory and joy that you experience, that you will experience one day with the Lord, what would happen? Well, the scale would just, it would completely outweigh the affliction. There would be no comparison. It wouldn't even be in doubt. It would just be like that. Just the glory would just totally outweigh your affliction. It's like, you know, maybe you get nervous when you go to get a jab or have blood taken. I, the older I get, the less I like needles. I used to pride myself as a younger man. Oh yeah, just give me the jab. I don't, it doesn't bother me. But now oh, I can't even, I can't look. But you know, what do they say? You know, oh, just a, just a quick pinch. You know, it's just, it's going to be over in a second. It's not going to last for, if they said, well, this is going to take about six hours. You know, forget it. I'm never getting a jab again. But it's just over, you know? I mean, just quick. When, when have someone said, listen, you've, you've won a sweepstakes, you've won a prize, and you have your dream house that you can live in for the rest of your life. It is just two miles down the road, and all you have to do is walk there. If you just walk there, it's yours forever. Would you do it? What if it was three miles? Four, five miles. Would you, would you walk five miles to, to have your dream home forever? When if it was seven miles? It's getting kind of far now. Who wouldn't if they were in any way capable of doing that? You would do it. You would, put, you would walk through the rain. You would put up with almost anything. God says... You've got just a few short years. And for your own good, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring some affliction into your life. It's not because I don't love you. It's because I do love you. It's because I want you to experience the, the, the glory of the gospel in your human weakness so that my grace will spread through this world to more and more people. And it will, be, it will hurt, it will be hard, but it's, it's nothing compared to what my son has already endured for you on the cross. And will you follow me? Will you trust me for just a short while? Put up with a little affliction, with a little shame, with a little embarrassment, a little hardship. Do it joyfully and patiently for my glory. And here, here's what, if you, if, when you do that, what will happen is that one day you will be with me forever and ever and ever and ever. Free from all pain and sorrow and all sin with me in glory for all eternity. And knowing that that's coming allows us and helps us to keep courage now. Really, eternity is, is just around the corner for every one of us. I mean, it is, it is just out of sight, but not far. And one day, you know, the curtains of this life will drop and you will find that the, the real eternal glory that you will have with Christ forever is just right there. It's, it's unseen right now but it's eternal. The things that you see, the pain that you feel, that is temporary. 
It is temporary and it has a purpose, a God-given purpose. Can you embrace that? Can you put your trust in the Lord and say, God, it, it, it hurts right now, it's hard, and I don't understand it all, but I believe you. I believe you. And I want, to, I want to look for and wait for that eternal world. You don't have to lose heart when you come into affliction. Put your trust in the Lord and let him sustain you in the inner self as you prepare for eternal glory. May God give us the help we need to live like that. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you and we acknowledge that often our, our faith is weak. And Lord, you know our afflictions. We're not persecuted. And we don't suffer much like the Apostle Paul, but we have our own hardships. Many of them are just inward and internal we pray that you would help us. Help us not to lose heart. Please take the hardships in our lives and use them to make us more like Christ. Use them to pour your strength and sufficiency into our lives so that we can, that we can speak of our own love for you and how you've brought us through difficulty like the psalmist did. We pray that you would be glorified in us and help us to encourage one another. Lord, thank you for every sign of grace in this room this morning. Thank you for every example among us today of someone that you've sustained and helped through trial. We pray that you would be glorified in us and help us to look to that unseen yet eternal world of glory that awaits us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.